what they're doing in years, you know, three, four, five, and six is no different to what they'll be doing in years 10, 11, and 12, and then even on to uni. Yeah. So the sampling techniques that we're using with them, they're very basic, um, and we're gathering data, and they will go and take that data away and ask questions about it in its simplest form. But then every time they come out or they, they think about going and uh, investigating an environment, they get to use what they've learned out here in the field. And it's that hands-on experience that's making Sydney Olympic Park a real destination when it comes to teaching students all about their own environment. Today, we're heading into the mangroves. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Yeah, so I very much was in the middle of bushland, and it's surprising considering we're in the heart of Sydney at Sydney Olympic Park Authority. It is really surrounded by mangroves and parklands, and you know what? It's not just about a stadium. They've really got a fantastic area to go check out. And you know what? That's exactly what schools have been doing. Today we get to speak with Danielle Lego. She organises a lot of the education events and uh, all those programming, all those visits for field work that the students get to do. So I was very much interested to hear what Danielle had to say when it comes to teaching an environment. And tell you what, Danielle had a lot to say. So uh, without further ado, let's go find out what the team at Sydney Olympic Park have been doing and uh, enjoy. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Danielle, welcome to the Physics Ed Podcast. Thank you very much, Ben. It's lovely to be here with you. Absolutely. Considering that we've just had a huge holidays, I mean, I've been in this uh, this education centre myself, running yeah. Lego Robotics and various things. Um, you got to have a bit of a break in Fiji. Lucky you. I did. It was a very well deserved break after a big term um, last last uh, term in Sydney Olympic Park. So it was lovely to be there. Yeah, and that was a huge term. I mean, you guys do a lot of education programs. That's why you're on the podcast in the first place. (laughs) But we had a huge first time up Innovations Games Festival, which was awesome. We did, that's right. Um, For National Science Week, we held the Innovation Games at Sydney Olympic Park in Cathy Freeman Park. And um, we had a, you know, wonderful turnout of people being able to come and, and present their, their science and technology um, and engineering stands from all over, over Sydney and beyond. And, um, and the local community got to, to engage with, with a bit of science, which was really exciting. Which is good fun. We can certainly get into that uh, as we go along the track. So like, uh, really also why I was very curious to have you on board was uh, just to find out how on earth did you yourself or even others for them find themselves as an environmental educator at a place like Sydney Olympic Park? Yeah, great question because um, so many of us come from so many diverse backgrounds and um, sort of different paths that lead here. Mine was actually relatively simple. (laughs) Um, I did a science degree to start with and um, following that, Wollongong University. Okay. And then did my honours year and you'll be a bit jealous. I got to do my my honours thesis on the um, coral reef in Lord Howe Island. Yes, uh, I am now jealous. So, yes, <laughs> um, doing sea level change there. And then um, after that, I realised that I really wanted to I really wanted to be an educator. I wanted to, to teach. Went back and did my dip ed and um, I uh, did geography and science and I ended up in a school that had just primarily a geography department. So I became a geography teacher um, there and I really got to focus on getting the kids outside, outdoors, um, getting them really to learn geography from a real life geographer's perspective, and um, then after that, I landed this job and at Sydney Olympic Park as the um, education coordinator. And I am now fifteen years, one month, and about three weeks and who's into count- that job. <laughs> and who's counting? <laughs> right. Well, wow. so have you seen much changes in a place like this over fifteen years? Oh. It has been incredible. Um, you know, Sydney Olympic Park is, I, I just, I adore the place. I love the place. And I've seen it change so much since just post-Olympic. So I started in um, two thousand mid-2002 and I have seen it change and grow into a place that has really embraced sustainable development and design. It's become a um, really excellent financial hub a uh, an events pre- major events precinct and also education has really taken off so we deliver to about 20 to 25,000 students every year face to face here um, at Sydney Olympic Park, and that's not including we've got five hundred thousand who actually come to the park for events like um, you know swimming carnivals, athletics carnivals, dancing, all of that. But just purely for environmental 
education in geography and science, we get about twenty to 25,000 kids a year. And yeah, through to Keith Urban and huge monster trucks and everything. You guys That's have everything exactly happening. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Sometimes we have, um, you know, the, the kids come from a concert the night before and they can't believe they're actually in the same place the next day when they're walking through the mangroves. So Sydney so Olympic Park exciting. is an incredibly successful model for other mm. Olympic parks to follow because, I mean, I mean, there'll be people listening all over the globe to this podcast and may have never been to Sydney itself or even the Olympic Park. Mm. I'm imagining that they might just ima- imagine it's a series of concrete buildings, some stadiums, maybe a couple of palm trees. I mean, uh-huh. let, let's just maybe describe where we're sitting. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually not that. It has a bit of that. It has mm. an element of that. But it is an incredibly well-planned place. So we, we have a master plan and we've had that from the beginning. Uh, we've got master plan 2030 at the moment and um, it's just been revised and um, we, we're we sitting in a location that has been activated to have um, 11, 12, 13, 14 million people a year You're through right. this place. We have 5,000 events occurring every year. So you work that out per week. And it's a lot of events. Oh. Um, and, you know, we've, we've won awards for that. We've got some wonderful international um, organisations and national organisations now that have moved into the location. We've got the Commonwealth Bank, um, NRMA have moved in, uh, Sam Sung are here. Uh, we've, we've got um, Macquarie, uh, sorry, Western, um, Western Sydney University College is here as well. So, yeah, it's, it's an incredible place. We've just had our first few uh, residential towers been built and we're looking at uh, a population of around about 25,000 people permanently on site as residents. Which means you're your own suburb. That's, e- that's exactly right. So I think it was 2008 or nine. Mm. we became um, a suburb, uh, 2127. And these people not only have all of those events um, at their doorstep, um, you know, the Royal Agricultural Society, the Easter show, uh, major sporting events, um, you know, uh, things like that, but they've also got 430 hectares of parklands. Yeah, I mean, we're sitting in the education centre here and just no more than 40 metres away mm. uh, mangroves. I mean, it's a That's beautiful right. spot, you know, a proper wetland community. That's right. So um, we actually are home to the largest stand of mangroves on the Parramatta River. We're so lucky. It's 40 hectares. And we have that because of something that was really negative in the past. We had a lot of land reclamation here. So we had a lot of our our bays and waterways filled in and and reclaimed um, for development back in the 50s and 60s. Um, But what happened was over time and and in, um, in the early 70s, the government stopped that process of land reclamation and we were left with these bund walls and these mangroves that were to be killed off mm. and and reclaimed and, and built on top of um, and they were, they were just left and what happened in the 1980s was because of the growth of Sydney westward we needed green space and so Bicentennial Park which is actually where we're sitting right now which has these 40 hectares of mangroves and about 100 hectares of, um, of open parkland space to come for a picnic and, and do things like that and go bike riding um, we, we needed that for all of the residents as Sydney was growing westward. We needed that green space. So in the 1950s and 60s, we actually had um, the State Rail Wrecking Yard right mm. here behind us, which was the hill um, that has now been uh, remediated and turned into a beautiful parkland. And that is what all of our residents who come and live here in, in our residential towers, that's what they get to look over, this beautiful park and these, these wonderful mangroves, and they get to enjoy them. Every and, day. And by definition, when you've got Western Sydney sprawling and getting bigger by the week, I suppose, mm. with the number of units being mm. built and things, mm. um, by definition, this would have a threatened community, a, a, a series, a number of species here that wouldn't be found elsewhere. It does, exactly. Um, so the salt marsh, which is part of the mangrove, oh, part of the intertidal wetland plant community, um, the salt marsh themselves are an endangered ecological community. So every plant that is found in the salt marsh here on site is endangered. Um, and harm to that via, you know, um, construction and, and the like is a fine of up to $220,000 or two years in jail. So um, it's a nice thing to tell the kids that they don't step on it. And when they do, all the other kids are right. telling them they're going to jail. But so not quite the case. All you aspiring chefs, yeah. don't be touching the uh, salt bush. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The, uh, yeah, the, the fancy uh, restaurants with their, 
with their suck a cornea quink for flora <laughs> that's on right. top of their salmon steaks. <laughs> yes, it, it's a wonderful place to be. Oh, absolutely. Now, um, obviously, you've got the public coming in and you get the, pe- the people who live in the com- that work and live around the commercial areas, they get to enjoy the park. But, of course, schools get to have some awesome excursions in here. Let's find out about those. Yeah, they, they do, Ben. Um, so we run programs from kindy right through to year 12, When if we're just talking specifically yeah. about, um, about schools, because we do also run some, um, some tertiary programs out here for, for teachers. Um, so in the K-12 realm, we really focus on geography and science. And in primary schools from K-6, to we, we focus on um, sort of a, a cross-curricular combination of, of geography, science and history as well because, you know, the park has this, you know, wonderful, rich rich history that the kids get to get to sort of um, be, be involved with on the day. So from, from K-6, to we focus the students on getting out and into the into the wetlands yep. and really engaging with nature. Um, today what we see is a, a lot of the students that, that come to us, especially from um, the Western Sydney area, don't have the opportunity to, or some have actually never been to a natural environment. Really? So their schools, you know, there might be a couple of trees and a couple of plants, but they are mainly, um, you know, concreted and, uh, you know, multi-storey buildings and not within a natural environment. So I suppose the most exciting thing for us to see out here is those K-6 to kids come out and engage with with the mangroves because it's such an amazing environment. Um, you know, we get everything from uh, in our, our freshwater wetlands as well. We get, um, you know, spoonbills and wonderful array of different types of ducks and our purple um, breasted swamp hens. We get we get crabs. We The, the kids get to, to dip net for tiny little water bugs that they don't know are in these waterways. They get to see fish. They get to see eels, things that they would never see unless, of course, they went to the aquarium or something yeah. like that. But they're getting to see them in there in their natural environment, even even things like ants, a row of ants across a pathway. The kids are screaming and, and <laughs> so excited to see those sorts of things. Um, so so that's K to 6. So we do um, programs that are, are based around the kids, really immersing themselves in that environment, learning about what a place is, learning about what it is to protect and look after a place, to engage with a place. And um, they also do, as, as we get into sort of the stage three, we also have a look at them starting to really start to understand how do you how do you go into an environment and get data from it in order to look after it. Right. So they'll do things like uh, do counts of, of crabs in quadrats. They'll do a transect and have a look at the different types of plants in an environment. They'll count the number of pneumatophores there and discuss why why there's so many little ones and not as many big ones and you know it, we, we try and get them to to gather this data and then ask questions about it so you know ask the why you've just dug out a memory of mine um a long, long yeah i feel like a long long time ago once upon a time <laughs> <laughs> at uni. Uh, but the um we had did a week of uh, marine ecology um and the I actually spent about four days in mangroves sampling crabs, doing um, mark and recapture. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's just amazed at how many thousands there actually are mm, when, mm. You, when you apply the proper ecological sampling techniques. That's right. That's mm. right. Exactly. And that's, that's what we get the kids to think about, that what they're doing in years, you know, three, four, five and six is no different to what they'll be doing in years 10, 11 and 12 and then even on to uni. Yeah. So the sampling techniques that we're using with them, they're very basic and we're gathering data. And they will go and take that data away and ask questions about it in its simplest form. But then every time they come out or they, they think about going and uh, investigating an environment, they get to use what they've learned out here in the field all, all the way through. So it's exciting to see that. Um, our Year 7 to 12 programs, they're a little bit more diverse now. We've actually moved with the new geography syllabus coming out this year and, and uh, sorry, last year and this year, we have moved some of our programs into the urban core and that's really exciting for us because the new geography syllabus from 7 to 10 has a lot of uh, livability in it. So it's about trying to teach the kids what, what sort of place do you think best suits people and their lifestyle, what can provide them with, with all their needs. And the really fantastic and amazing thing about Sydney Olympic Park is that when the kids come out here and we have a look at livability as we walk around the park, they they do a survey on that and they have a look at things like, um, so factors within livability include um, safety and security, 
um, access to facilities, uh, linkages. So how do you get from place to place? How do you get in and out of here? What are the um, amenities like? What sort of access do I have to natural environments, um, to clean air, to, to clean water and things like that? And as they, they go around during the day, at the end of the day, we have a look at what they've gathered and they actually find that this is a highly livable place. Yeah. So it's really fantastic for them to be able to get out of the classroom, stop looking in the pages of a textbook at what is livability and actually see it in in play, actually see it happening um, and, and get them to understand what it is if they want to become, you know, future designers, engineers, um, you know, town planners, social sciences, um, mm. social scientists, then this is sort of the first step to do that. Look, look at what is around us because often students don't do that. Um, they don't have a look at what is around them and what makes things a positive experience for them to be in and what makes a negative experience. This um, got, got me thinking, you know, imagine there'd be a number of tertiary researchers actually researching exactly what's happening around this area because with urban expansion, I mean, I'm mm. thinking about Ra- Rouse Hill Town Centre and oh, a yeah. few other places like that could easily copy this model. Yep, absolutely. That, that sort of multi-purpose use where you've got, um, you've got your work, you've got your play, you've got your sport, you've got mm. your live. So you're here to, um, and one of, one of our, our lines is about um, come to Sydney Olympic Park and, and live learn, eat, stay and play. So all of those things in the one location, if you lived here, it's not, you know, you don't have to go very far (laughs) to, to, you know, to enjoy everything. Obviously there's, there's downsides, things like, you know, during the the Easter show, which is an incredibly exciting event to be a part of, um, what we have is people living right on top of that. So that may be an opportunity to, um, to enjoy the place for most of the year, but for um, for two weeks of the year, you do have a little bit of noise and screaming. But you know, it's all it's all part of the the adventure of being in Sydney Olympic Park, seeing these amazing um, events act, really activate activate yeah. the place. Now, you've been a you know, a geography teacher. You've been teaching environmental science for over fifteen years. I can't remember mm-hmm. how many weeks, days, and hours, <laughs> <laughs> but it's there. Um, which means you've got a, a real depth of experience to draw upon i'm just sort of wondering if you had to suddenly walk out this door you had a mob of kids turn up i'm calling a mob because they're gonna be a rabble (laughs) a proper rabble like 30 students they're gonna hang out underneath Mm -hmm. the marquees here Mm -hmm. and unplant and -hmm. you had to run an experiment or something that was going to grab their attention in environmental sciences or maybe it could be something different Mm -hmm. what would you what would be your go-to thing if someone just turned up with 30 kids let's give them just say Mm -hmm. let's give you a, a focus let's say they were a bunch of year fives Oh, fantastic. Uh-huh. I love that age group. Love that age group because um, they're, they're the ones that are still really excited about about the little things, mm. but they're not at the oh, I'm too cool for school sort of situation. So um, in that case, it's, it's about getting them out there amongst the mangroves. We've got this wonderful boardwalk that winds all the way through the mangroves. And um, when they're out there, so there's a number of things we can do. If it's totally unplanned, I would be getting myself, we, we have a permit to collect a bunch of leaves a day yep. from, from fisheries, from the DPI. So I would be collecting um, a bunch of leaves. I would be collecting some mangrove seeds off the boardwalk. I'd be collecting some pneumatophores and I would be getting them to experience that environment by, first of all, licking the leaves. They love doing that. The <laughs> reason we lick the leaves, I know it sounds really random. Salty. But the re- yeah, the reason we do that is because they're salty. So some of the kids go, oh, they taste like, you know, like salty chips. Mm. Um, and that's right. So we get them to really use all of their senses. And um, so we get them to go in there. And if the tide's in, it can often smell like the ocean. So it gets them thinking about, oh, where's this water coming from? And what's it got in it if it's coming from the ocean? And then, um, you know, licking the leaves, start getting them, well, why have they got, why is there salt on the leaves? This doesn't happen anywhere else. And getting them to, to question those sorts of things. What's the tree doing? What's a, a, a land tree doing growing in a marine um, environment? And having them think about adaptations and how do things change to to actually be suitable to grow in in a harsh environment like this one of the really cool things that I see happen here is um, because I coordinate a, a group of educators who have a really really wide range of backgrounds um, we've got a fantastic educator here called Dr Sarah Bricky and 
what she does with students is she allows them to immerse themselves in the environment through meditation. So she does like this mangrove meditation with yeah. them. So I definitely get them to do that. So they sit down in the middle of the of the mangroves and she talks to them very calmly and quietly about it and how peaceful it is. And then from there, um, they get to sit there in complete silence. And that's really unusual for any student to do at any time, let alone be in the middle of a city of, of four to five million people and be right in the heart of that city and have complete peace and quiet. I remember someone doing that to us at a year 12 retreat. Um, nice. And yep. the, um, I mean, I'd never done it before, lying down, very quiet, and it mm-hmm. was in the bush, by the way. Yep. And by the time... The time everyone was relaxed, and the person said, "Oh, by the way, you've been here for an hour and a half." And I remember my heart just started racing. Up. Oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right! An hour and a half it yeah. freaked me out. I didn't realize just how time could just pass. Exactly, and it's a really good thing to do with kids as well because very rarely do we actually get them to to stop and think and um, and listen to what's around them. So really, listen to to everything that's in that environment because all they do all day is often listen to teachers, listen to educators, listen to their parents, listen to to their friends, um, you know, listen to themselves, chat, and to just get them to stop and listen to what is around them and 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 smell and and in our case taste as well. They can get down, they can they can pick up the little the, the mangrove snails that, that live in the mangroves and that eat the leaves and help to break down all of that organic matter that gets in there and we start talking about you know, um, cycles within the natural world. And, you know, there's so many things you can do. What's really cool planes. about it is what you're doing is you're doing the observation or you're doing the experiential, and then mm. we can go into the analytical later. It's nice exactly. to throw them all together, which is really, really cool. That's right. And uh, seeing that you do, you look after a, a number of um, different community groups and school programs doing all sorts of stuff, but also the educators themselves, which mm. means you'd have people coming from diverse ba- backgrounds, some of them are highly experienced, yep. and some are fresh out of uni. Mm. For those people who, uh, who want to get into this type of game, the environmental education game, whether it's yep. Within the school or a precinct like this, mm. what would be some advice you give them? Okay, um, well, I've got an excellent example of um, someone who who came to us who was a very passionate geography student when when she was in high school, and um, she then went on to do environmental management at university, and she and she uh, majored in physical geography as well. She came to us and she did some volunteer work. So for um, about a month or, or maybe a bit more, she, she came here, she saw what we did, she helped out every day. Um, she, she had a really positive can-do attitude and before she knew it, she was, she was in here working. Yeah. And um, it's, look, it's all about having the right attitude it's about being positive about what you do and passionate about what you do. Um, all the educators out here, absolutely, uh, the thing that drives them is about getting kids to experience nature and seeing them just change from the beginning of the day to the end of the day just because of of the experience that they've had out here. Um, so, look, beyond that, we don't necessarily um, say you have to be a teacher it is really uh, helpful if you've had some experience with um, delivering some form of, of um, you know, some form of experience to to children, uh, whether that be in a, a before and after school situation or um, maybe through the YMCA or something like that. Oh, totally. Um, some of our educators are, br- are brilliant educators of physics and they've got a mm, summer camp background as well exactly. as teaching. They're great. That's exactly right. Mm. So you just need that enthusiasm and passion and that's what rubs off on the students. Mm. If they see that you love where mm. you are, then they get really excited about that as well. So it's not about the ABCs of whether you've got, you know, um, a, a Master's of Teaching or things like that. Having said that, we have also had staff who've come to us with a, a non-teaching background and just with a, a science degree or an environmental management or environmental science degree. And after working here, they've actually gone and, and gotten their teaching degrees. And um, <laughs> yeah, so one of them's become um, just a couple of years ago, become a, a high school science teacher. And another one, uh, another person who uh, was here with a science background became a primary school teacher. Yeah, we've had four people. I'm thinking one was doing a research in uh, retinopathy. Um, so they're doing a protein analysis, working out why does a retina 
fibers go due to various issues with diabetes. Yeah. We've had other people who've done cosmology backgrounds and particle mm. physics, and yeah. they've all gone their teaching background, and the saying at work is we've broken them. Yeah. <laughs> or, or perhaps yeah. maybe for the listeners, I think we're, let's flip it the other way, we've made them. That's right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Around. We've we've just sort of, you know, got them onto the right path. Yeah, and, you right. know, I mean, teaching is is an amazing it's an amazing career. It can be incredibly rewarding. Being in the classroom is highly demanding, very demanding. Uh, the demands of, of um, you know, curriculum and, and things like that and administration nowadays is in, incredibly difficult, but it's, it's really rewarding. Um, I'm just lucky that I landed this job and um, and I'm not in the classroom anymore, but still get to enjoy that, you know, that, that the education of, yeah. of young people. It's been wonderful. Danielle, thank you very much for coming on this podcast. Now, no doubt there'll be some people who want to get in touch with you, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. hearing that, uh, you know, things are coming up and then maybe, well, who knows? It might be, you might be working with them, who you know. <laughs> so, uh, but even if you, even not just about positions, just outright how they could engage with the precinct and the park itself, um, how could they get in touch with you? Sure. So um, there's a couple of avenues we can go. Uh, you can get onto the Sydney Olympic Park website, which is sydneyolympicpark.com.au. Uh, uh, you can subscribe to get the what's on uh, electronically and uh, that gives you all of the events. Um, and on our website, we've also got a range of different drop-down menus that show you events or places to stay or things to do um, as well as the uh, what's happening in tours and education. So um, people can also contact us directly at education at sydneyolympicpark.com.au. Fantastic. And if you want to know a bit more, especially some of the festivals have been organised, jump on the Physics Ed podcast. Well, I think it was episode 16. I think it is. You have to go check it out. Tell me if I'm wrong. But the Innovation Games, we actually had a whole bunch of excerpts, about three or four minutes from various people who presented on the day. It's quite a lot of fun out of that. Mm. And um, certainly, I really encourage you to get in touch with Danielle and all the team here at the Olympic Park. And uh, I'm going to finish up because I'm going to go walk the mangroves. Oh, what a <laughs> lovely thing to do, Ben. Well, thanks for having me. No worries. Have a good one. Thanks, Ben. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. Isn't Danielle just a fantastic ambassador when it comes to the environment and teaching kids to love it? She really is. And I would love to be involved in one of her field studies. It would be awesome. So, look, I'd love to know what you think. Hey, drop us a line. Drop us a quick email through the physics website. It'd be great to hear. Now, certainly there was a lot of things to take home from this episode, but here are just my three ideas. I'd love to hear what you've got in mind too. So, number one, do some field work. Take your students out on a trip. Go show them the bushland. It's so good for not only their learning about their biology or whatever the syllabus outcome that you have to teach, it's just good for them to get them out in nature. And that is 100% what they're doing at Sydney Olympic Park. Hey, number two, how is the built environment interacting with your environment? You can hear that Sydney Olympic Park is really looking at ways that kids can learn about how you know our modern day life meshes with the natural environment. And it's really important considering how much urban expansion is generally happening. Hey, number three, the environment has a lot to teach us. It's not just through what you get to see. Use all your five senses. What can you see, of course, but what can you hear? What can you smell? What can you touch? And if you have a naturalist with you who can make sure everything's nice and safe, what can you taste as well? So yeah, when you go into the environment, it's not just about what you get to check out and take photos of, what else is happening around you? And actually, you know what? Get the kids to go out there and just for a moment, get them to close their eyes and listen. Maybe even take some recordings and perhaps it's a chance to submit those recordings to citizen science organizations because you just might discover something new. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. Yes, using your five senses to learn about the world is so important. And uh, with that in mind, I think let's uh, do a little bit different this time, uh, Ed Tip. We're going to do a bit of cooking. Why not? Let's learn how to cook baked Alaska. Now, let's be honest. There's going to be people here who will do a way better Alaska than me, a baked Alaska for sure, because everyone's got their own take on it. But here's just a nice one we've written up on our website. And by the way, just jump on the physics website, type in baked Alaska, you will find all this recipe there. But uh, you know what? Let's use our you know, a taste just for a moment. Why not? Let's just do a bit of that and learn a bit about science and more importantly, how heat moves 
in this experiment. So first up, there'd be people who don't know what baked Alaska is. Well, it's a dessert. It's very nice. It's composed of like a warm, fluffy meringue shell with a chili ice cream center on a base of a sponge cake. There's a lot of different variations, but they often involve having a blowtorch to cook the outside of the meringue shell instead of just baking it in the oven. Those certain people will do that too. Either way, the whole cake gets blasted with very high heat, but the ice cream inside doesn't melt. So how on earth does this work? Well, first up, you're going to have to make it, right? So here's your ingredients. Get some ice cream, get uh, three egg whites, get about 150 grams of caster sugar, and get it, you know, save your time, go get yourself some sponge cake already made, or if you're really good, make your own sponge cake. And of course, yeah, let's just a bit of an allergy warning. Yes, there is egg in it, so make sure whoever's eating it can eat egg. But anyway, here's your method. Separate your egg whites from your yolk and pour into a small, clean, you know, metal bowl. Now beat that on about low to medium with an electric mixer and whisk and whisk and whisk until you get white peaks that are nice and firm. It'll take, well, about, you know, five minutes or so. Then you turn it right up, like turn your beater right up and slowly pour in some caster sugar over about five to seven minute period and keep on beating it and beating it for another several minutes until the meringue starts to look glossy. Now, at that point, it's time to line a tray with some baking paper and place a nice thick slice of that sponge cake you went and bought at the shops or all you might have made and uh, get some of your really nice ice cream. Personally, I like chocolate, but hey, up to you. So get a big chunk of ice cream, put it on top of your slice of cake, and uh, now with the spoon, get that meringue you just made and cover the whole lot, totally cover it. And at this point, you're going to give pop it in the oven for about, about two to three minutes at high heat, about 230 to 250 degrees Celsius, then remove from the oven and you know slice and serve. Or if you want to be a little bit more dramatic, add a blowtorch to it, people will go, wow. But here's the deal. The outside of the meringue will be you know nice and crusty and golden and caramelized, but the inside, the ice cream will still be okay. And it all comes down to how heat moves. Heat tends to move from hot things to cold things. I mean, that's pretty much the rule in this universe. Now, the foam and the layers of air within the meringue makes it difficult for the heat to travel through. And they make basically a really good thermal insulator. So basically, the outside gets crusted up, and the inside, the ice cream that's very cold, is nice and cold. Now, I'm wondering, what's the application for this? Well, uh, you know those space shuttle tiles, those tiles that protect our spacecraft as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere from orbiting? Well, it's those air bubbles that are trapped inside the tiles that actually act as an insulator and stop the whole spacecraft melting as they enter. It's really, really, really hot. Now, of course, you um, when you do the experiment, of course, make sure you eat it, because I did say we're going to use our five senses, but you could turn this into a variable testing chance as well. So is it really the meringue that stops the ice cream melting? So you could put some ice cream on without some mer- meringue and see what happens. I mean, pretty straightforward. Or could you coat it with other things? Do you use icing sugar or something like that? Does it make a difference with the whipping time for the meringue itself, or the amount of sugar, or the heat source? Have a bit of a play with it, and... Uh, have a bit of fun with it and more importantly have something to eat so there you go there's a tip of the week this time we're going cooking and make some baked alaska this is the physics ed podcast we're excited about science grab a copy of our new book be amazing how to teach science the way primary kids love from our website just search be amazing book it's available in hard copy and ebook go to physicseducation.com.au that's physics spelled f-i-z-z-i-c-s Yes, I really love my baked goods. Oh, baked Alaska is so nice. And if you've never had it, hey, it's time to make it. It's really quite easy. Jump on our website, type in Baked Alaska in the search box. You will find it. And actually, while you're there, just go uh, check the website for a bit more. There's 150 free experiments. It will keep you busy for a very long time. And I tell you what, your students will love you for it. You will make your classroom and wherever you work so much more engaging. And uh, speaking of making things engaging, Ali Watson in last week's episode is making girls incredibly engaged when it comes to coding and doing computational thinking. Let's have a listen. Programming in its essence is just problem solving. And even, you know, whether it's a small problem or a big problem, the way you tackle that in terms of programming it is you break it down into little bits. Yes, the work that Ali Watson and the team at Code Like a Girl have been doing to get girls into coding has been amazingly brilliant considering they've only been around for a bit over a year. Stunningly really well done and it's well worth your time checking out last week's episode. And hey, while you're there, go subscribe. There's so many more episodes on the horizon and there's a heap in the back catalogue too and it's all come to how we teach STEM in a really positive way. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. 
It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed podcast, but there's still more to come. Next week, we are speaking with Shireen Sparrow. Now, Shireen's been heading up the Lachlan Macquarie College for quite a while now, and that is a group where a whole bunch of teachers right across New South Wales are sharing ideas on how to teach science in their high school. Very good chat, and Shireen was lovely to give us a bit of time in a very busy afternoon for her term four conclusions. It's Yeah, she's got a lot going on, but I tell you what, she's got a lot of gold to be shared. So until then, I hope your classrooms, you your museums, your zoos, your aquariums, wherever you might be working. I hope you're making your science awesome. I hope you're making it as engaging as possible. Hey, you're listening to me. I'm Ben Newsom from Physics Education, and I will catch you another week. Bye for now. You've been listening to another Physics Ed podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book, and more go to physicseducation.com.au.